2016, presented by the Santa Clara County Office of Education, Santa Clara County Library District, San Jose Public Library Foundation, the Commonwealth Club, Silicon Valley, and the Tech Museum of Innovation. My name is Tim Ritchie, and I am the President and CEO of the Tech. The theme this year of Silicon Valley Reads is Chance of Rain, the impact of climate change on our lives. Tonight's panel will ask Silicon Valley leaders if this region is up to the challenge if a long-lasting drought leads to extreme <coughs> water rationing. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Benjamin Parsonbach is the author of Sherwood Nation. Jim Fiedler, Chief Operating Officer of Water Utility Santa Clara Valley Water District. Raise your hand, guys. Larry Gerson, Political Science Professor Emeritus at San Jose State University, who is currently working on a new book titled Trouble at the Oasis, Water Politics in California. And Brian Patrick Green, Assistant Director of Campus Ethics Programs at the Markle Center for Applied Ethics an adjunct lecturer in the School of Engineering at Santa Clara University. And moderating tonight's panel is Barbara Marshall, Editorial Pages Editor for the San Jose Mercury News. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panel. Um, and the book uh, hinges a little bit around a water activist named 
Renee, who, because she's caught in this hyper media loop of, um, of the press, uh, gains a huge following, very much wanted by the city, and she ends up seceding a section of the city and running it as her own nation. So. Oh, and I feel like I should also add that uh, I have, I'm a fiction writer. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in any way t uh, attempting to prognosticate or create a real life uh, thing. I'm just, uh, as many uh, fiction writers do, uh, thrusting people into a very interesting situation to see what it's like in a sort of sociological playground. So. When did you start writing this book? Uh, I, I started in 2008, so I think that's, that also has to do with a lot of it. In the midst of a massive economic collapse, uh, being somewhat frustrated with the direction of the government at the time. Uh, and yeah, so in between a, a massive economic collapse and, uh, and the incredible California drought, sort of caught in a lot of truthiness. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, uh, our, our theme here is, is could it happen here? And Jim from the Water District actually uh, knows a great deal, knows everything there is to know about the water in California. And, and uh, says it kind of did happen here almost back in the 20s. Sure. You know, you think about could it happen here was sort of the theme of our presentation here tonight. And the question you meant to my mind is, has it happened here? And the answer is yes, it has happened in Santa Clara County. And it happened as early as the, the late 1920s, when this region was going through some serious issues with overpumping of the groundwater basin. Uh, land subsided that was occurring in the county. And the drought of the 1920s that got many people very concerned about what's the future for at that time, knowing the Valley of Hearts to Light, how were they going to survive? And so the citizens in this case did revolt like they had in, in the city to separate out. You know, the citizens got together and said, we need to form a conservation district, which was formed in 1929 for the express purpose of better managing water supply. Because prior to that time, there was no management. You dug, you dug a well, conditions used to be artesian, where water flowed out of the ground naturally. That was exhausted. But the realization was that something had to be done or this region would not continue to thrive. And so in 1929, the district was formed. In 1931, there was a vote taken to basically empower this district to issue bonds to build the reservoirs. And the campaign at that time was to vote for water or desert because the land was subsiding and the groundwater basin was depleting. And as a result of that, that vote, in fact, in the book, it describes Nate Marians or Robin Hood, two of the real advocates. But there were advocates at that time, one with the name Fred Tibbetts, who basically uh, conjectured that if you build local reservoirs, you could actually then store local runoff and then recharge it into the groundwater basin. And so those were constructed in the 1930s and some of the 1950s. Fortunately, they're still in use today to allow us to basically store the runoff that you had in the last week's storm, the last two days' storm. And that we basically captured about close to 20,000 acre foot of water in that storm event over the last few days to have that water available for later in the year. So that just gives you an idea that, yes, it has happened, it continues to happen, we can talk about that later tonight, but the initial foray was in the 1920s and how the nation or this region got together not to form a Sherwood Nation, but to form a conservation district to work together to help provide water supply for the region. Yeah, that would, that would be the sensible way to do it. It doesn't sound like that happened in Portland in, uh, in uh, the Sherwood Nation days. Um, politics today makes it difficult to do things collaboratively. Is that safe, Larry? <laughs> Larry is writing a book on the politics of water. And, and the thing that strikes me is people, people have ideas about the right thing to do. But you know, same ideas, and they um, they get caught up in water rights that have evolved federal and state over time. That at this point limit. Well, well, water rights are certainly part of the mix, uh, and we know going all the way back to before California was a state that many of the land grants, including water grants that exist to this very day, privately owned sources where people go ahead and drill wells, have no accountability for them. And in some cases, you know, the Central Valley these days, 
Uh, some of these cases private, some not. Well, so we're as deep as 2,000 feet. What's happened, of course, the water table is coming down, way down. And uh, it's going to take an awful lot of light years to ever bring it back if it doesn't come back at all. But that's only part of the problem. I mean, this is, if you view water as a, as a scarce resource, and I think that's a fair statement, what we're looking at here is uh, a fractured, uh, a, a, a fractured series of governments that, 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 that govern that, its operation. You've got the federal government, not only in terms of the, the uh, Central Valley Water Project here, but other projects as well. You've got regional governments, uh, Colorado Aquifer, California touches on that, seven states a share that water, which is also going down. You've got the state itself, you've got local governments, and you've got private governments. And there's virtually no coordination. I mean, no coordination. I know that's a shock. Um, but, but, but when you're talking about water, there's no margin for error. And just one quick thing, California today population-wise, it is twice the size, twice as many people as in 1970. You know as well as I do, we don't have twice the many. Well, perhaps the last name to exception. Okay, but we don't. You know, our average rainfall year is going to be going down. And so we have twice as many people, we have average using up to 80% of the state's water, representing 2.5% of the state's gross domestic product. You got a problem because a very few of uh, 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 people you know, are using most of the water, and the sources from which that water comes are just gone. Uh, Brian, in our conversations uh, prior to this, uh, Brian brought up some really interesting ethical issues that evolve in this in this book, and you can see them playing out here. Um, making value judgments based on self-interest or public interest or balancing public interest. Uh, what, what interested you the most? What are there, are there characters that really struck you as iconic or surprising? Uh, the main character of Maid Mary, I found a really interesting character um, in that she tried to, she was, she's obviously put in a very difficult situation in the novel and the decision she has to make in order to, to try to solve the problem that she's placed in, that would be a really interesting question. Um, and part of what really fascinated me right there is that they're in such a difficult situation that they largely have bad options to choose from. Um, so it's, it, the city government's kind of already decayed to a level where cooperation has really deteriorated, and so it's already kind of broken down into pieces in a lot of ways, and she's just, uh, kind of uh, just goes into, into the way the situation is and tries to make the best of it. You mentioned uh, one of the interesting things to analyze ethically in these situations is how far back do you have to go to be able to make a good decision right. and not be stuck with making a bad decision no matter what you do. And I thought of that today. I wondered where we are on the continuum Did you, uh, do you have a sense of that uh, ethics? I, I, I think that now we have a bit of leeway, I, I would hope. I, I'm optimistic, um, you know, because it's been raining, right? But, <laughs> I mean, but we've been dealing with this drought for four years, and so one, I mean, there's a couple of years ago where it just plain didn't rain for months and months and months, and I turned to my wife one day and I said, what if it just doesn't rain? And the the idea of it just stopping raining. I mean, we rely on these natural resources. We don't realize how reliant we are, in a way. But uh, uh, and at the same time, we have to have to do a lot to the environment. We take away its water, away from fish. For example, we were talking about the delta and uh, how how so much water has to stay there in order for the fish to survive. So there are all these these uh, you know maybe maybe we're already in kind of a losing situation if you're talking about with the environment. Um, but so far for people, we haven't gotten so desperate that we're clawing each other through the water. Um. It might be different on a national stage, though. Do you think perhaps we've gone past the decision making point where we can make good decisions? <laughs> <laughs> Just <Yeah>. generally? <laughs> generally. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question, too. I, I guess we all know who would build a wall across 
Rocky Mountains. That's right. Uh, it is a frightening time. Larry, what do you see as the prospects for bringing people together over this or any issue right now? You know, politics is so funny because we don't really do anything until we're at such a critical point, a crisis, that suddenly we have to move like crazy to get things done. The problem is when you're dealing with infrastructure issues, uh, water is well, certainly that, you can't just turn things on a dime. When you're talking about repurposing, not just water, but perhaps the way we use the land, you can't do that really quickly. Uh, you know, when you're talking about setting up new values for people to think about how to get through life, and these two take the time to settle in. Think about things that we all have dealt with, uh, seat belts, uh, car seats uh, for children. Uh, you know, think about all the opposition that went along with those things, and they're fairly minor compared to the way we manage our use of water. Uh, can it be dealt with? Can it be fixed? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually half the glass full, if I can use that metaphor, uh, type of guy. Yes, I think it can be. But we have in front of us some serious sacrifices to make. And I'm not sure that people are yet ready to see it that way. They will be. They will be. But you know, we have a good year like this year, you know, and suddenly, what drought? What drought? Okay, people's memories, they go real fast. Put this on for two decades or so, yeah, and by that time, I think we're going to see some very serious regulation. I, I, I would hope to see some consolidation of government uh, so that we have some singular direction here, And but it's going to take a long ways before people are behind it. If I could add a tiny bit to that, I, I think that's so interesting because I think, especially for a drought, because natural disasters of other kind, which are, which are mostly instantaneous, whether they're earthquakes or uh, floods or hurricanes or even forest fires, which are very short time spans. A drought is almost outside of our understanding as humans uh, in terms of its time scale. And certainly, like you were saying, a, a single water year can completely erase our memory in terms of how we feel about water and our relationship to water. And we just don't know whether this drought that we're in is going to be ended next week officially, or if it's got another 30 years and it's the new norm. And I, and I think that's kind of a fascinating thing and a very difficult challenge to plan for that. Well, it's a visual thing, too, because because a, a typhoon or a hurricane, you see the damage for years, right? It, it, it's there. Or a forest fire, or like we have so many western fires in this past year, really, the past two years, cause tremendous damage. And you drive anywhere near it, it, it resonates. Now, what's going on? I live in a neighborhood where people are pretty good. They don't water all kind of stuff. Their lawns are coming back. My lawn is gone. My, my wife, thank you. Okay. How many of us have one back to back our lawns? And so, and, and so, and so the lawns come back, and the memory goes. You know. So I think it's a long term. And if I might say, I, I think that a drought and our understanding of its time scale and our ability to predict it. Is a fairly good facsimile for, for climate change. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, has been somewhat troubling that up to, if you were to go to a party prior to the drought, maybe you go to a party now and ask your neighbor or your friends, oh, do you know where your water comes from? Do you know where your water goes after you use it? You know, virtually, here's something that we know we cannot live without. We can live without many things, we cannot live without water. And yet, for most of our citizens, they have very little grasp of where the water comes from and what it takes to deliver that high-quality water that we all want to have. We want the confidence to drink it out of the tap, to know that it meets or exceeds drinking water standards. And it comes in sufficient pressure, not only to provide water for my household, but to make sure that if there's a fire in my neighborhood, there'll be enough water pressure to provide for that fire suppression necessary to help me still live in my neighborhood. So I think with the drought, though, it is, has awakened people consciousness that they're thinking a little bit more about water than they traditionally have. And in Santa Clara County, uh, the citizens responded pretty admirably. I mean, for the year of 2015, I think we got 28% conservation over 2013 usage. Pretty astounding. Well, we thought we were doing pretty good in 2013. And so our citizens, I think, are really altered their thinking. And perhaps the, the memory retention will be a little bit longer than, say, had it been. 
But that's very important. But it's also important for us on the water side to realize that our citizens have basically done a great job and they've hardened their demand, which means that if, we, if the drought continues, what are we doing to really assure that we're planning, we're implementing programs with whatever governmental bureaucracy that exists so that we can continue to provide that level of supply for public health and safety, for our quality of life, there's enough water for ag to grow crops that we need to live, produce that's locally grown to live on. Both of the challenges will be faced, but it's going to be done in a combine. It can't be done with us telling you. It's going to be done as we've been doing it, getting listening to the community and having it be a community effort to provide for the supply for the future. In uh, watching communities and politics over the years, it has just struck me it's very easy to get people excited about an event, you know, you have Katrina and half the country runs to New Orleans to help and there is a sense of getting over it, getting, you know, fixing things up and it will be okay in the future. I think we're a lot less good at staying focused on a problem. People get excited when something is revealed as a problem, but speaking just from a newspaper perspective, you can only say the same thing so many times and have people pay attention to it. They just they just don't. How do you how do you all think you can approach that? What we can what we do besides preaching constantly, which does not always go over that well. It is certainly the market. I, I, I'll let somebody else speak on that, but that's a, that's a time tested way. Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say? The market. Well, the market's certainly part of it, it makes it so expensive, all right? But, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem in itself, right? Because some people just pay whatever. We know of cases in, in the Valley here where people use just horrible amounts of water because they don't care, right? Uh, and I, I, I think that, that's part of it, right? And that's, that's got its problems too because just like air, we don't have a choice with water, you said. We don't have a choice. And so you have to think about pricing things at a point where people who need it can't have it. So I don't think it's just market. I think just pounding into the public again and again and again and then again. Uh, we're going through this now with in, um, uh, texting. Uh, don't get me started. Uh, uh, in the car, okay? You've all been at that intersection of life is green, the person's there, you know why? You know why? Because he or she's not finished texting. You know, the light can wait. And it drives me nuts. Well, it's a big ticket. It's not a big enough ticket. So you talk about the market there, yeah, you've got to make the cost of that so great. You know, add a point to their to their insurance thing and and and, and make it so awful that they have no choice. Um, I think that's the kind of thing we're gonna to have to do with water. We don't have a choice with water. This is not an optional commodity for us. We, we need it to live. And that's why I think government is going to have to really get serious about it. But when I say government, we have to find a way to consolidate the way it's done right now. Yeah, which government comes to the question? Oh, I was just gonna say also with, with the idea of uh, the market regulating supply and demand, it's very easy to get into class war situations, which is, which is, we were talking about this earlier, which would happen in Detroit when uh, a large part of the city uh, was cut off from water because the water utility said that they all owed money. And whether or not, you know, it began this debate of whether water is a human right or not. And I think it adds, it's, it's a very interesting thing to regulate because each, each of these, when I think about air or food or, or water, they each have their interesting market problems, right? You can only breathe so much air. You can affect other people's air, but you can only breathe so much. You can use a, a limitless amount of water, and that's a, that's a very interesting quantity. Uh, but yeah, for foods, uh, the, we issue food stamps. Is there something like that for water payments? And well, there's lifeline rates. We're, we're not a retailer, but a retailer do have lifeline rates. Uh, to support that. But one thing about uh, you know, how do you uh, get, you can have a market share, you can have marketing, how do you inform people about how much water they're using? Right now, you currently uh, get a bill, maybe it's two months ago, you can find out what happened. If you had a leak, you'll find out, oh my gosh, I guess I had a leak over that period. Better call the water company and say, I had a leak, maybe they'll adjust my bill. 
So I think the future is going to be more real-time information to users of water. So just like right now on your phone, you can get kind of your usage on your phone, you can find out your energy usage per app. That, that same technology can be used to provide you information about your water consumption. It can give you warnings, it can give you alerts that says, hey, you're using too much water. So I think real-time information might really drive the, the matter of home, your own Fitbit for, for uh, water usage. That you can really better make choices about what your water is using. And as Barbara mentioned, we've all tried to cut back, so I had a pretty large use of the water. I live on a large piece of property, and so I cut all my outdoor watering off entirely. I'm at 70 gallons, my wife and I are at 70 gallons per capita, I mean, I mean for the whole house, so 35 per capita. We've been at that for several months, so it can be done, but you know, you have to make choices about what you're going to do. And so those are the type of things that with information, citizens can make, like you all can make better choices about how do I want to use my water more effectively. Right. I, I just wanted to say it's, it's interesting here to, to see the, the different ways we're talking about regulating water. Um, Larry, you were talking about maybe we should make larger fines or something like that. Uh, Jim, you were saying maybe we could set up a system, whether it's through apps or something like that, that helps people to, uh, to know their water use and control it that way. And it's a really interesting question whether you should be addressing it as a moral issue. Should you be addressing it as a, in a kind of a top-down way where you're setting up a system where it helps people to succeed or, or keeps them away, you know, carrot or stick, whichever way you want to do it? Um, or do you want to make it more something where the individual makes a choice, but if they mess up, then they get a fine for it? So I think that's an interesting regulatory issue. I just want to add, I think for me, the, uh, another big part of this is the distribution. Where is it going to go? Okay, where is it going to wind up? We know already that over the last 50 years that the normal flow of water, 100 years, go back to the Owens Valley, uh, the normal flow of water has been, the word they like to use is repurposed. I love this. <laughs> repurposed. Okay? And in the process, you know, it, 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 it's converted, you know, uh, into uh, semi-arid areas uh, for great, Imperial Valley is a great example of that, but Central Valley is too. Uh, and and, and the, the water intensive crops are grown that, you know, cost enormous amounts of, of, of water to get the crops done. I don't know that we can continue to do that. I just don't. So it's, I think it's not just a matter of the end user, but who gets to be the end user and at what cost? Jim, we have a couple of questions uh, for you on, kind of address this, but in, in the view of somebody who works with this every day, what is the likelihood of us getting to this point? What, what factors will will it be? Getting out of the ground? Getting, oh. well, getting, what is the likelihood of Sherwood happening? Okay, well, uh, in anarchy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not quite anarchy. <laughs> well, um, I think, obviously, none of us really want to get to that point where citizens really are so frustrated with government that they really need to form their own government. And I think Renee in the book was a, a great warrior, a champion for reason and thinking not getting caught up in a lot of the hysteria that other people at the time were also you know, facing. But so she was a great role model as far as really being an advocate. There's many of those in our community, some of you are, that you're advocating for ideas that you don't think are really being represented well enough by government. And so what's your outlet for that? There was a time the way government worked, and still does in many degrees, they decide, they somebody else decides something, then they inform you, and of course then they have to defend their position of what they've done. I think collaboratively, we've sort of tried to change that whole landscape to get more a government that's by the people. Uh, I think the idea that the solution is going to be command and control is not going to be the way it should be. Uh, we have government saying this is the way it's going to be. It should be more self-determination or regional determination about what's best for the region and having the collaborative effort of those of you who have a stake in it to have a say in really what we should be doing. And so, as we go forward in time, as we think about what's our future in water supply, yes, it's going to be the local reservoir still providing water. Yes, unfortunately, or fortunately, the way you want to look at it, we've had to import water into our region because we, we lost the sustainability of locally developed water many years ago. But we do have a future of repurposing wastewater, purifying that, 
And then having that be a locally controlled, drought-proof water supply to help meet our water needs going forward, that's why I think tomorrow our future in Santa Clara County is going to go. I drank uh, wastewater at the, uh, at the plant. It was totally awesome. <laughs> purified wastewater, sorry. Purified wastewater. <laughs> Uh, Let me just say, our, some of our reporters have taken to refer to this idea of circulating super purified wastewater as toilet to tap. Oh, uh, you're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to say that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, well, first of all, I wish you guys could all see Jim Fiedler's hand here because he has on his hand a, a ring with a uh, water drop on it. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure in, uh, when it hasn't rained in 60 days, you move that over to your ring finger. Uh, uh, but but uh, what I was going to ask is, is just to probe a little further on that question. Just uh, if this drought that has happened here, which, which I, um, well, Larry and I were talking, I think it is in its severity, even though it's a very short drought comparatively uh, to historically speaking, the severity is, is uh, much like you. California hasn't seen something like this in a thousand years, I think. If this drought continued for another 15 years, can you can you set that stage for us of what what the Valley Water Authority would be? Where where you would be? Okay, this is really crystal ball in it. This is the doomsday. Uh, this is Sherwood Nation. Uh, one thing we try to do in water management, not only providing it for our citizens, but also to protect so we don't have overdraft of our groundwater basin. So to duality, water supply, this time, because if you do, in fact, lower the groundwater basin, we're going to continue to have land shortage and subsidence. We've had portions of Santa Clara County that have subsided 10 to 20 feet. Right now, more than Santa Clara County get protected by levees because portions are below sea level. They subsided because of overpumping. So if you fast forward, we want to make sure, we have this job with you for multiple years. We've got to think about what's the best use of water. And then also, what are the best source of, of additional water? The sun says it's insane. Doesn't take a lot of brain science to realize. You look out over the Santa Cruz Mountains, and you see the Pacific Ocean. And you realize there could be a potential source of water supply, even in the Bay. A plant just went online in Carlsbad that produces 50,000 gallons a day of desalted water that serves uh, the San Diego County Water Authority. So when you think about the future and the necessity drive what we do, you either have to migrate out of the area, use a lot less water, or find additional drought-proof sources to help the region thrive. I find it interesting that in the book, um, the government that failed was the Democratic government of Portland, and the government that briefly succeeded was the dictatorship of Sherwood. And, and thoughtfully so, and some discomfort about that on that area's part. I wonder if a dictatorship, a benevolent dictatorship, might be the only answer. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was certainly playing um, with that idea. Essentially, um, how able is our representative democracy at handling times of extreme crisis? Um, and I think, I think that we're still debating whether climate change exists is one indication. Um, I was also borrowing heavily from um, the Roman sense of the word dictator, uh, which was which didn't have a negative connotation. We have a terrible place in our mouth when we say dictator today. There have been some amazing dictators throughout history. Um, but uh, a Roman dictator was somebody who was elected by the council to handle extreme crisis uh, for a very short nominated, not, not really elected. Uh, to handle extreme crises, whether it's you know it's the Visigoths are invading, or um, there's a malarial epidemic uh, that that is essentially society unraveling, and so one person takes charge and handles it. I I'm not for dictatorship, but it was it was a very fun thing to play with, uh, just because her ability to to make rapid decisions and unpopular decisions. Decisions that aren't funded necessarily by some larger corporation or law firm uh, made a huge difference to the citizens of Sherwood. So. We have a number of folks asking about Flint, which of course was on our minds earlier when we chatted. Uh, it, is, it is a devastating situation. Um, thoughts about how that's being handled, how, how it is playing out. Some
someone asks, what can we do to help Flint? It's a long way to send water. Uh, any thoughts? Well, one, it allows you to be informed, understand what happened there. Certainly, you uh, want to contribute funding, and that's something that you feel empowered or inspired to do. Certainly, work with whoever to help support that. The situation in Flint is one that is very troubling because here you, like you all, you put your trust in whatever your, your government, your water providers, and the fundamental assumptions we, we have here is that when it comes out of the tap, it's safe to drink. And the government says it's safe to drink. And then you have a situation there where, no, they weren't telling the truth or they didn't know, they didn't listen to the concerns of the community. So you should also be aware, could it happen here? So if you go to our webpage, valleywater.org, we have a, on our front page, we have, we have the very that could it happen here? And we explain what we believe the safeguards we put in place so that it could happen here uh, because of issues. In that case, they, didn't, they had corrosion hindered, they weren't putting into the water source, there was a pH of the water they weren't managing, uh, and so they were leaching out lead in the, the, the pipes in the homes. Something that we don't want to see happen here at all. Because all the other people before the 1980s may have lead fixtures or lead pipes in the house. But uh, so on our webpage, we explain if you have concerns, there's places you can go to get your water tested. So when you talk to us, we have to provide our webpage, we give you the lead gun. Lead in our water is not in the tap. Uh, so we'll give you an idea. But it is cause of concern because fundamentally it's a trust issue. It's a, it's a basic human right for if we're going to provide the water, then it should be safe to drink. And if it's not safe to drink, we should tell you it's not safe to drink. Just to clarify, when we were talking earlier, you explained that that the issue is, is not that lead pipes exist, but that the water was not treated to prevent the leaching. Right, so in other words, what was happening there was the water was of a certain quality that actually was taking the lead out of the pipes and, and putting it into the water. We, we provide in our water system, we make sure that we're putting corrosion inhibitors that we do not leach anything out of the pipe. And we also have a pH of the water that makes sure it doesn't, you know, cause that corrosion nature. And that's what was happening there in Flint. Can I ask a somewhat possibly naive question, which is, um, is there no national standards body for water quality? I mean, uh, this, this is obviously municipal testing, but why is there no government body that's involved in that kind of assuring water quality? So that, you know, I mean, you never know, and everywhere you go, water tastes different in you have no sense of whether it's potable or not. Well, some of the stories reported that there was testing and yes, there was testing and there is standards. But it looks like either misreading or misunderstanding the results of their test that they weren't doing sufficient tests to make the conclusion that the citizens are already reached. The water didn't look well, didn't look right, it didn't, it didn't taste right. They were having health effects. And there was other symptoms of a problem that were being ignored because all the, uh, the test we took, it looked like it met the standard. Uh, yes, the EPA does have standards, you know, but you can have all the standards in the world, and unless people comply with them, it doesn't matter. It's just like a speed limit law. Unless people comply with it, it doesn't matter. And there are enough bureaucrats around to make sure some of that comes from, from inside, from with us as, as, as citizens. But I want to take a, a go up to 35,000 feet where I live. Um, and, and, and just point out that the Flint, Michigan thing resonates because it's Right in front of us, we see it now, but we have issues of, of inadequate water systems, uh, uh, power, uh, road systems, bridges, infrastructure in general that have been hounding this country for 20 years. We have deferred maintenance in California alone of $80 million just in roads, state roads. It's another 60 million, in, uh, billion, excuse me, uh, billion, 60, 60 million in local roads. The, the issues go on and on and on because we are pushing back all the things we need to do to protect these systems, bad hands, what, whatever. Okay, and I, I think, you know, sooner or later, this is going to hurt us big time. And people are sounding the warnings, and most of us don't listen. The other, the other point I want to get is this, you mentioned command and control. I bristle a little bit of that, so, so let, let me let me that. Uh, uh, this is this be a little of therapy. Um, it isn't so much that I love this command and control, I would appreciate that. You mentioned you, you know, regional solutions. This isn't a regional problem. This isn't a Santa Clara Valley problem. This isn't a California problem. This 
This is a Western United States problem. You talk about the drought in, in, in Oregon, in Washington, in Colorado, you name it, any state west of the Rockies over the last few years has suffered. We don't think about that because we're concerned about ourselves. And then you have this limited supply of water, and I don't think we can leave it to regions to worry what they're going to do about it. You know, because in so many places, there's no governance whatsoever, even today. That's why I think we need to pull this together and come up with a more centralized approach. I have a carpeting audience here that is, is particularly thoughtful. Many decades ago, drunk driving wasn't considered a problem, but today our perspective has changed. People do still drive drunk, but there is considered to be a moral issue with it. How can we make water conservation a moral issue? I think that uh, I think water use has become a moral issue recently, and I think uh, that was very visible in the way that uh, green lawns have been uh, pointed out and sometimes ridiculed or shamed. Um, I know that there was, at least in my neighborhood, there was a person who had a green lawn, and they felt the need to put a sign in the front of it saying, "This comes from my own well in my own yard. <laughs> I'm not using the city water supply." So it's it's very interesting to see how how those come into the social consciousness after a while. And there's been public shaming in newspapers as well, if I'm not mistaken. There has been some of that, yes. Although what we've tried to do is try to present our agency, we not try to single out the abusers, we want to recognize the achievers who have done more to kind of really step up and use them as examples for others to follow. You know, so I think that's been very helpful for us. I think we always want to look at the, who are the bad actors out there and you know, start pointing fingers. But I do think you know, it has become some of a moral issue. People are looking at and being more self-conscious or self-aware of what they're doing. You know, you water footprint. But if you want to go there, when you want to think about your water footprint, think about the clothes you wear, think about the food you eat, because there's a water footprint in everything we do. If you want to be really a conserver, go vegan. Because vegan diets use much less water than a meat-based diet. And so there's other thought processes behind that. So don't just think it's only my use of water here. Uh, in my home, there's a whole systemic nature of what tends to produce the things we, we enjoy in our life. But I do think it's an awareness issue that helps us think more smartly and responsibly about what do I, what can I do to serve and what can I do to help others follow that example. Maybe I can tie this into something that Larry might have to say, but um, do, do farmers have a moral obligation to grow drought-resistant crops? I mean, I know that, that almonds, which I believe they, they tore out hundreds or millions of almond trees, getting my facts mixed up, but, but certainly that is a massive uh, use of water. Uh, uh, now, uh, now farmers are going to take them <laughs> But um, I'm going to count from my recollection for 9% of the water used by agriculture. Uh, of course, it's a very common crop. Yes, farmers can be dealt with, but, but part of it can be done just with better irrigation, drip, drip irrigation, things like that, which which have a, 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 an upfront cost, but after that, it's fine. And they've done that with some grapes in, in, in the uh, uh, vineyard industry. Uh, it can be done. Uh, getting people to change those is another story. What, what, uh, do farmers have an obligation? I don't know, but now we get to the, the cost issue, okay? Do you charge farmers more? Well, some of them don't pay a dime. Even to this day, they don't pay a dime. Do you realize that there are half a million homes in the central valley near Sacramento that until two years ago had no meters? No meters! Woo! Everybody come to my house with the water. Uh, so, so, I mean, you know, we have a long way to go, not just with farmers, but others. Uh, but I do want to touch very quickly on the desalination. That is an opportunity for us. San Diego now has 200,000 people online getting water from their plant. There were several plants in various stages that were a mothball. Santa Barbara's got one. Now they're, that's coming back to life. We're on the coast. They can't be that way in Colorado unless they're using all the homes. Okay? Uh, so we have an obligation here, I think, to take advantage of that, use modern technology, and we could go a long way towards making our patients a lot more uh, manageable. Is the technology moving fast enough that, uh, I mean, part of the problem with desalinization, as I understand it, is that it produces a lot of pollutants, a lot of waste in producing the water. Jim, are you Yeah. Well, you know, one of the charges we have, and much of the work we do, the government, 
is to choose alternatives that are at least environmentally damaging. So how do you look at the footprint that a desol plant has or a purified plant have? There's an energy footprint, also a CO2 issue. There is a brine or the RO concentrate and some of the waste that's produced off the system has to be disposed of. How can you do that in an environmentally responsible way? Those are things that need to be looked at as we think about these options. So we think going forward in solution, we have to look responsibly about how do we make sure we don't transfer the environmental footprint from one area to another? How do we do that in a way that minimizes the environmental consequences? And we think about all of our history, in this in Silicon Valley, even in the West, projects were built that tried, at the time, they did the best of their thinking with regard to the environment, but there's no way, in, as enlightened, if you want to call it that, to where we are today in terms of making sure we don't impact endangered species and other factors to it, which we have to be very aware of as we do projects going forward. So the desol project in Carlsbad relied upon an existing lagoon system from the adjoining power plant and is discharging in that same discharge stream of that power plant. So they tried to minimize the footprint of, of what, what could happen with that operation. If we were to build a desol plant in the bay, we have issues of intake, of where we're going to intake the water and what are the environmental aspects of that. And then, the, the, and then we have to worry about what about the reject that has to go back into the bay. And what is, what is that concentration doing to the marine environment, to the environment in the bay itself? I have a, a nice comment here on, on the book that I will read and, and uh, uh, some of you might want to comment. In the book, there seems to be no villain, only bureaucrats trying to stick with traditional methods and individuals who, out of desperation, try new things. There seems to be a conflict between innovation and fear to depart from what is more familiar, even though it isn't working. That seems to reflect on our politics today. Thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, they got that right. I, I very much like the idea of not having, I, I mean, I think everyone plays at some point a villainous role uh, in the book, and I love the idea of, uh, I mean, when I wrote this, I, I wrote it uh, partially as, as a protest against Hollywood uh, apocalyptic uh, stories where you have these um, these Western mythological characters who ride off into the sunset, and I, and I wanted a lot of gray area and a lot of that. So yeah, that was that was uh, something I, I attempted, and I think also is what we were talking about earlier, which is um, with a drought and the understanding and, and lack of understanding of how long it is. It's very difficult to know when and how to commit, whether uh, policy-wise or technologically, uh, yeah. Did you? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I enjoyed the moral complexity of the characters, that there, there is uh, one character who bent on revenge, and he finally has a chance for revenge, and he decides not to, so it's just really interesting. And there are other cases where uh, the people who are, have previously been heroic characters <laughs> end up making decisions, you say, oh, that probably was a bad decision, better if you hadn't done that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the, the moral complexity was very interesting. Unlike real life where we never make that decision. The other reality is that uh, some of us baby boomers are moving on. And also we have to think about the future. So hopefully there's going to be main areas within the government structure and in, in the industry and whatnot. You want to be people from outside having to sort of fight their way in or be, you know, take alternative approaches. But the reality we face is, is that we're all aging out. We gotta make sure we have a workforce that is going to be one that's gonna be able to be trained and operate and bring their own millennial ideas and beyond to really transform where we are. Because we can't outsource these jobs to India or China, they have to be done here. We gotta make sure we have a workforce that's interested in this career. And for the most part, people are not necessarily interested in this career because they wanna go high tech in Silicon Valley, not water supply or wastewater treatment and whatnot, but we need people that can bring and help us carry this forward. I mentioned earlier the people in the 1920s, and then some in the last 100 years or so that have really transformed water development. But we gotta think about how the next 50 years, what's gonna happen there? And we need to have people in place that really can carry on and do whatever magic that they're gonna be able to do to, to sustain our region and the quality of life that we've come to enjoy. 
And I'll just observe, I don't think there are too many millennials in this room. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to direct your right. I can always say stuff I ran along. But if you should go. I didn't I didn't mean to call on you, I just thought you um, a couple of people asked what what is uh, the average water consumption for an individual, for a family of four? Is there a way to, to quantify what we might be expected to use per day or whatever and what is excessive? Yeah, you can look at your own water bill, you can look at, uh, go online, there's ways to tell you how much, and in various, if you're in a drier region, you know, in other parts of the state, there may be different uh, evapotranspiration rates that might, if you're going to have plants that are going to be growing, you may be using more water for that. How many people are in your household, uh, what other measures you're taking, you have low flow toilets that, uh, that use 1.3 gallons per flush or whatever, those are the type of things you can do, you can do the math. Cover that up. But typically, we say we use one acre foot as our sort of our tool. That's about 300,000 gallons, whatever. But one acre foot of water can provide two families of ten. Uh, there's no more families of no families of five. You know, <laughs> two, two families of five. I should say. But it's like we don't have families of five anymore. We have families like two. So in other words, uh, that's sort of a rule of thumb. But I would look at your water bill, and then I think it comes down to you know what are you using? You start thinking about where does your water go. You can start doing some you know, mathematics pretty readily to determine, you know, how much am I using? And how much do I need? And in terms of your, your, your yard or whatnot, and, and can you convert that over? Can you take that grass out and put drought tolerant landscape in it? The answer is yes, you can. And so you can lower your water footprint on your own property. But as I said earlier, there's other factors that go into your total water footprint. The clothes you buy, the food you eat, they'll have a water footprint. I can sound like that more a little bit if you want. I uh, just happened to read that it's 181 gallons per California on average per day. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's a total simplification, but uh, per California. Per California on and average. That, that would include agriculture use and everything. That is all the water used in California. I believe so. I read it on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Larry, uh, someone in the audience asks, has there been a time in which uh, water rights were withdrawn and reallocated to support new water realities? It's so funny that that question has been asked because the legislature is working on that as we speak. Yeah. As we speak, there were you know, said, there have been some gray areas that they've already dealt with, but the big ones they have. And this whole question about people buying private water rights from other people. Some of the big ones, uh, there's a guy named Stuart Resnick, you know, it's a huge, huge water operation in, in the Central Valley. And, and, and he's not the only one. People like him have said, okay, oh, and, and by the way, it's legal. So I'm not trying to make him or any of the others into a villain here. And so they, they, they bought these rights, and they still have them, and it remains to be seen whether the legislation is good. My feeling is, and I'm not a lawyer, don't play on TV. Uh, that, that in the end, you know, here's where we get to the power of eminent domain. And uh, I believe this may well become a case because of the critical nature of this commodity that the legislature will prevail if they carefully pursue this uh, and, and work toward gaining control of, of that uh, in, in, in a more reasonable way. There was a lot of resistance last, I think it was last year, when uh, the the attempt just to regulate pumping when the land is again subsiding in agricultural areas, huge pushback. Yeah, and, the, and, and, the, and as far as here's how far we got, you now have to report how much water you use. That's it. <laughs> I can use 47 thousand gallons yesterday. It was a long shower. That's okay. You just, just report it. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's how they stop. Yeah. May I ask a question uh, that's related to that? I'd be curious from everyone's perspective here, just on um, in in the book, I talk a lot about rationing and and that water is rationed and you get a very specific amount every day. Um, and I'd like to know about the ethics of using rationing versus market, whether it's technologically possible, whether it's ever been done in, in extreme droughts. Well, I know, for example, in some countries they turn on the water for you know a couple hours in the morning and they turn it off. 
that's one way of rationing it. But it would be really uh, an interesting and strange situation to have that happen in the United States. That would be really interesting. I know I worked in Peru in the early 80s, and there they lowered the water pressure uh, to kind of, you had less water pressure, you couldn't use it much. And most people had, and this is throughout the world, most people have cisterns on their roof. So when the water pressure is good and it's available, they put it into their storage on their own. It's in Israel as well. They put it on their in their in their cisterns, so they have that source when the system is not functioning. There were times when the day there was no water pressure, and but it does create great concerns because we rely on water not just to uh, consume, but we use it as a conveyance for our waste. So if you have this, that same thing that happened in Cherokee Nation, there was no way to to move the waste out. So you have another issue, and you talk about waterborne diseases. You talk about a whole history of water development in the world. How you control disease because many people did not survive, and it's a big issue with waterborne diseases, not only from the water standpoint, but from the waste collection standpoint. So, the waste treatment was very instrumental to, to control typhoid and other diseases that were branded in the US and elsewhere. But also, you had systems put in place for chlorination, so the advances that, were, that occurred to help provide uh, you know, a, a safer water source. There's another rationing technique. So I spent some time out in the Pacific Islands on islands that don't have very much water and also in Australia where they've gone through some very long drought type situations. In a lot of those cases you collect water off your roof and you have a giant tank in the back that holds, I don't know, 5,000 gallons, maybe 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 gallons depending on the tank that you have. And if you run out of water, of your own water, because you're not connected to another water supply, you have to buy a truck full of water to come out and fill up your tank and then you're back on your tank again. There are actually places in this country that the relatives of mine bought a house in Kentucky and when they first bought it 10 years ago, um, they had a cistern in their house and there was a water truck that came around if you needed, if there wasn't a lot of rain and you needed water. Um, it happens. Um, I'm sorry. Well, okay, I will. I will do this. In Gunfighter Nation, Richard Slapkin summarizes our American ethos as believing that there is no problem so difficult that it can't be solved by a sudden burst of technical violence. Are we looking in the wrong place for a solution to the drought? Is there a sense in which this is a social sharing problem and not a technical Something from the past, just 
by considerators used to be a prevalent in the alleys of cities. Well, you don't have alleys, you don't have considerators anymore. And I think the launch going to go too. And that's a fairly low tech way of dealing with the problem. That will save a lot of water. Can I just add to that? This, this question of technological solutions versus moral solutions is what I talk about in my classes all the time. I teach ethics to engineers. And so it's always a question of, well, we could solve this technologically, or we could solve this morally. Which one are we going to choose? You always choose a technological solution, because moral solutions are so difficult. Actually, getting people to change their behavior is so much more difficult than handing the problem over to some engineers and say, solve this. We'll throw money at you to solve the problem. And that's become just kind of a common solution now. And I think you're right on the geoengineering question. Ultimately, that's, that's almost an endpoint that uh, we seem to be defaulting towards. You know, I think uh, we can engineer, but we're going to be much, much smarter. Uh, you know, they call it biomimicry, where you can actually look at how does nature actually do it, and let's see if we can channelize that versus think that's conquer nature. I know uh, there was a noted geographer, Gilbert White, who basically in the 1930s to the 70s really was championing low impact development, <coughs> that no adverse impact versus flood protection. Yeah, flood protection and floodplain just, just exacerbated the problem. Poor people lived behind a floodplain and then we had flooding. It created uh, you know, repetitive flooding, which happens throughout. Why we build it in the endorments the way we did is crazy. We, we built back there, it'd be crazy. Because it's in a flood prone area, you know, a lot of problems. And yet we have areas of our own state that are in flood prone areas that if it makes sense for us to simply rebuild, we gotta be smarter than that. Because why are we spending a lot of investing a lot of money to just put people back in harm's way? And the next big flood happens, our uncertainty creates that conflict. So getting back, I think, yeah, we gotta be we can be smarter. But I do think it does take that moral compass to help us think what's the right, what's the best choice for everybody? And not just making it easier for one at the expense of another. I think we are getting a time signal. Does, does anyone have anything they would like to add? Ben, would you like to, what was, how, what's your sense of this discussion? Have you got issues that you were concerned about? I, I thought it was uh, really fun. I, um, I mean, I, I think the, the, the question, I'm still heated in the heat of the debate here, and I think the one question that I would still really love answered is from Larry, when Larry talks about we need um, a comprehensive policy across regions, how something like that is, is put together. Because I, I, mean, I see that too. I mean, I, in a way, I sort of I look at like uh, at our um, our high courts, our Supreme Justices. Uh, do we need something like that to, to to monitor and create rules that are outside of election cycles and outside of? Oh no, 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 no! I'm not suggesting that at all. I think this is going to be the kind of thing where all stakeholders come together. Uh, probably the form of some sort of national conference, but we elect we elect people, we elect Congress, we elect the president. We like the governors. So these people are not, you know, going to drop down from the sky. These are going to be largely elected officials, along with the bureaucrats who are, who are and scientists and whatnot, who come together. And somehow, out of this, I would expect you'll see something like an Equal Protection Act, uh, you know, uh, uh, that kind of thing, uh, as we've seen before when we get to major issues of the day. And like major issues, it won't be solved tomorrow. And I will argue that also, whatever the time takes, it will be, it will be uh, hastened only to the extent that the crisis grows. The, the faster the crisis grows, the sooner someone will respond. And that's one of the shortcomings of human nature. You know, we always wait until we're in big trouble before we actually act. But sooner or later, I think there will be a national approach to this thing. Because I don't see any other way that we can really work independently and at odds with one another. You get the paralysis of analysis and keep working and working issues. You think about the great decisions that made about water. They weren't made unanimously. They were made very contentiously. Think of the state water project that was voted by the citizens of California in the 1960s. That election for the state water project which transformed California won by 51.5% of the vote. And it was a measure that was equal to the state budget at that time with a very large measure, very important decision. Think about what if that had not passed? Well, maybe we would have had Sherwood Nation earlier. <coughs> Brian, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I, I just think that the, the situations here are really interesting, it, not just in the novel, but obviously in what we're living in right now. And there's so much moral complexity to everything that we've been talking about. And it's interesting to see 
how everybody go, how, how we'll progress. It's definitely human nature to wait as long as you can, and then when the crisis comes, will you be able to handle it or not? That's the ultimate question. I, for one, hope uh, Sherwood Nation remains a fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we will close. I'd like to thank our wonderful panel.